uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, you know this morning uh, on this very very special day as we talk about a topic which is very close to my heart which is economic development through equitable access to energy and santosh just gave us an outline of what we are trying to focus on in the next 60 minutes uh before we begin i would like to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful forum uh the nudge foundation in partnership with the rockefeller foundation and the skoll foundation uh honestly a 24 hour non stop event is no mean feat i've been doing a number of webinars uh, during covid times and each webinar takes uh, so much of effort and so much of time so hats off to you guys congratulations uh in this panel i am joined by three very very eminent uh, personalities we have uh, reema nanavati ji she is the director for rural organizing and economic development at seva the self employed women association of india we have dr ajay mathur uh, currently the director general for terry the energy and resources institute and we have mr ashwin dayal who is the senior Pre vice president for power and climate at the rockefeller foundation uh, none of our panelists actually need an introduction all of you know them uh, therefore i'm not going to spend our precious time uh, doing that uh i have actually known all three uh panelists for very very long time but i've never had the opportunity to have a conversation with all of them together i have have one on one conversations uh i worked in terry but i never got the opportunity to work with dr ajay mathur there but i very closely been uh, working with uh, reema ben and i've been interacting with ashwin for many many years now uh so it's a it's a it's an honor and a pleasure uh for me today to be in conversation with three three such uh, panelists who i really look up uh, to and i think the topic today is very very important it's sdg 7 which calls for universal access to affordable reliable sustainable and modern energy services by 2030 and we'll get into you know what it really means uh, you know and somehow what people interpret it many time uh, but before we do that i just want to mention that on the logistic side uh, we have about 60 minutes Uh, for this session and we have to end in time because you know as we, as we know it's a 24 hour digital platform uh, we will try and keep the last 10 minutes for a q and a uh, i know that a number of people have joined from different platforms so please use the chat section and the q and a section in the platform that you have joined to post your questions the attempt attempt would be to take as many questions towards the end as possible uh, so we'll we'll try and wrap up the main content of the conversation in 45 to 50 minutes and then spend the last 10 minutes on q and a uh, before we get into the discussion i wanted to share some of my uh, thoughts and then i will uh, request our panelists to come in uh, for me why is it important to continue to talk about sdg 7 and continue to talk about universal access to energy is uh, you know even though even though a lot of people say that so much progress has happened we see numbers uh, and especially in india where you know uh, the sobhagya scheme has been has been an amazing scheme and amazing initiative by the government of india which has connected almost everyone that we have uh, in the country so why do we still continue to talk about it why is it important uh, globally number of people without access to electricity has fallen from 1.2 billion to about 789 million in 2018 2019 you know renewables are doing very well a number of countries are uh, launching new programs every day so why is it that you know we still continue to talk about it for me personally it is very very important for all of us to keep in mind that sdg 7 is just not about electricity access it is a lot more than a basic electricity connection it is about ensuring universal access to electricity to clean cooking solution increasing the share of renewable energy uh, you know increasing our progress on energy efficiency and also increasing international collaboration so it's not just about providing a connection or providing a clean cooking solution to an household or to an individual it is a lot more than that which is why uh, for me it is very very critical uh, you know that we continue to talk about it especially during these days the covid crisis has you know hit everyone very very hard and you know as a lot of people say that it has uh, it has been a great leveler but uh, in my view that is not the case it has it really brought in the disparities uh you know the urban india which has all the all the connections and everything at house we are sitting and doing these digital uh, platforms there are people who do not have full energy access you know only they know what they are going through right now uh, honestly initially the covid crisis also gave me sleepless nights not just you know on on what what's happening in my personal life or professional life but you know what is really going to be the full impact 
of this crisis on energy and poverty and it's really not known which is why uh, you know it's it's important to talk about it uh, but it, it honestly it has taken you know it, it's disappointing that it has taken such a pandemic and such a crisis for all of us to realize the importance of energy uh, in the health sector in the education sector uh, parts of uh the world you know stakeholders have always been talking about it but now almost everyone talks about it everyone talks about how will the vaccine reach if there is one uh how will they reach the rural uh poor you know how do we really address health issues right now in areas where we do not have energy access where ventilators cannot function uh 24 by 7 so it has taken such a big crisis for you know all of us uh to talk about it these are now becoming dinner time conversations but also at the same time uh, I, this is something i've been saying in other webinars that i participated is that i'm an optimist uh, i try and look at the positive things of life and i do hope that you know all of us will come out uh, out this pandemic stronger uh, and the world will become green and we'll all become more sensible at the mi micro as well as macro level and get to the sdg 7 targets and the efforts of the last decade will not get uh, derailed and it is in this context that this entire session has been uh, curated and we have as that a three panelists who will bring in different views uh, from the area that they work in they have wealth of experience uh, with them uh, and with that i am not going to talk a lot more than i have already done i am going to bring in reema ben uh, into the conversation first and for those uh, who are listening to us and have not had the opportunity to visit seva's uh, seva's work on the ground and haven't seen a seva member in action you really missing something please please try and do that uh, next time you are around uh, so reema ben uh, you know you, you you and i have known each other for so long and i know that you've always looked at energy access beyond lighting i know seva started you know looking at lights and clean cooking but you know you've been looking at uh, solar water pumping you've been looking at the solar park and the salt pan worker so you know how how do you see that to be a key contributor in india's growth story and how can it really be scaled up how can this effort that seva has in one state how do we take it to the next level not just within india but also globally because this is such an amazing uh, initiative it's a great business model how do we really make it part of our story on uh, energy access and economic development Thank you so much, and it's been a real privilege to be on this panel with you, Anjali Ben, with Ashwin Bai, and Dr. Ajay Mathur. On, on, especially on this Independence Day, what more could be a greater celebration for me and the 1.9 million sisters that I am talking to uh, on this panel today on their behalf? I think uh, what. to your question what we have learned from our members over four decades is that poor do not want charity but i think what they want is partnerships partnerships that will equip and enable poor and their own energy enterprises their own economic organization in their fight against poverty and i think this is what we at seva call it as our second freedom um the freedom from poverty hunger and starvation how do we have that achieved by having access to energy or you call it energy inclusion so i think uh, um this is what is the key and i think the second important lesson is that um it gives the women uh, uh, how do we also take a family as a unit of organizing but under women's leadership so we all talk about gender gender inclusion equity but i think the basis is that you take a family as a unit of organizing um an initiative designing an initiative but under the leadership of women this gives the women and their work the recognition and the dignity that you know the household needs to give the society needs to give the community needs to give she is able to then participate in the decision making again at the family level at the community level in order to increase women's participation in energy related decision making what seva has embarked upon is energy household energy planning and budgeting so how much does the household allocate you know for their energy needs both for domestic needs as well as for livelihood mechanical or professional needs 
which includes transportation and other needs as well and then how do you see that you know the women's needs for energy are also budgeted in the family entire income and then women are not only seen as users or consumers of energy but they are also owners and managers of their own energy enterprises um the next step then comes is that how do you do a community or a village or a slum level energy plans these are consolidated based on the household level plans and these village energy plans with the participation of women you see some extraordinary innovations coming out from this whole process for example solar powered flour mills are needed or small solar power milling units are needed or small scale chilling units or solar power sewing machines are needed or somebody needs a solar roof so that you know they are able to minimize the need of lighting in the house and its natural lighting because for a lot of the informal sector women workers their home is their workplace as well one new concept that has emerged in this whole process is the backyard energy farming in the villages and i think this is and then it, this is all integrated with plantations vermicompost roof rain water harvesting so the village in totality becomes a green village and i think this is how you scale up because it throws out ample opportunities for livelihoods um there are local opportunities for you know employment both for men and women for the young as well as the older and nobody then wants to migrate and that is how what your question was that how do you scale up and then the movement takes place so thus every household produces its own energy need for consumption the surplus energy is fed into the village microgrid and when the village has surplus energy it can sell to the grid or to the neighboring village so the village becomes green and also energy self sufficient um the next then comes is that how do you skill the local uh, youth you know young boys and girls to become energy technicians so clean energy technician feed for you know repairs and maintenance of cleaning devices or you know lighting devices or agriculture devices and i think uh, we we started by only a small pilot of two villages and on its own it's now gone to 50 villages and the demand is increasing so for me this is the future of work for the informal sector workers in india this is what is the future of work um, which will throw a lot of employment opportunities and i think um, we uh, have to see that how the policies are made to incentivize the villages to incentivize the households that embark upon such clean energy uh, initiatives thank you so thank you reema ben i think that's a very very important point especially you know when we have seen this large scale reverse migration which has happened actually not reverse migration the right migration which has happened back to rural areas and you know this is really the need of the hour so thank you thank you so much for sharing those thoughts with us uh, you know i would now uh, want to bring dr ajay mathur uh, because you know dr mathur has worked with a number of organizations he's also seen a number of organizations in action uh, so dr mathur while we have you know uh, organizations that work on the ground there is seva and many others who are really trying to bring a change and using a bottom up approach but you uh, personally have looked at those organizations but you've also been involved in policy making you have worked with multilateral bilateral organization and now at terry where you work on both the sides so you really have uh, you know an understanding and awareness of the entire spectrum uh, that we deal with all the stakeholders so what what do you think uh, is a good approach to bring all of these together how do we really break the silos uh, you know and get the stakeholders to operate and cooperate uh, with each other so that you know the model that uh, reema ben just spoke about and you know ashwin will talk about uh, on what smart power and rockefeller are doing how do we really take them to the next level and how do we respond uh, and i also want you to bring in uh, covid here and you know how do you 
how do you get organization and individual to stop looking inward and actually look at you know the impact uh, of their actions uh, on the world so dr mathur over to you thanks thanks anjali uh, i want first of all like you and rima ji congratulate everybody on this independence day and i hope that by the time we reach we observe the 74th 75th independence day next year we would be out of this hole that we are in where we are economically challenged we are socially challenged we are environmentally challenged the answer however lies in the kinds of things that rima ben just spoke about in my view there are three parts to this answer two of which have been addressed by uh, rima ben the first is you must have a technology that works works in all situations at least the situations in which you are working so for example if we are talking of uh, uh, rural applications of energy for uh, various kinds of livelihoods well it must work it must provide the energy services at the time when it is needed the kinds of raw material you need must be available the kind of maintenance you need must be available the second is a business model you know it's very good to say that this technology works but people should be able to provide it and make money from it that's their livelihoods we are not talking about huge incomes but we are talking about incomes that enable decent livelihoods so having business model so that he can he has there's a supply chain the person can buy from there are buyers to whom she can sell there is a infrastructure based on which there is either you know some kind of uh, quality control or reliability whether it is branding or whether it is the name of the person but a approach through which quality control is done these are the first two the third is the question that rima ben asked how do you enable this at scale and today uh, and i'll you know the covid question actually makes this even more important how do you accelerate this so acceleration and scale are the third part so the first is the technology should work the second is that the business should work and the third is that the policy uh, instrument should enable acceleration and scale i want to spend 2 minutes on this you also asked about covid in fact what covid has done is brought back attention from pure economic growth to economic growth which creates jobs and jobs which are sustainable so they are not flashes in the pan they are here tomorrow they are here day after tomorrow and so on so economic growth job creation and sustainable livelihoods are the three goals that covid has brought in so whether you look at what we do about mass migration whether we whether it is what we look at declining sales all of this at the heart of it are these three goals let me use an example uh rima ben talked about so about water pumping and the kind of leadership that they've taken in solar pump how do we enable this to occur across the country so in my view one of the good things that the government has put come out with is the kusum scheme where the key is that the electricity that the solar panel produces in excess of what is needed by the pump can be bought back by the grid it is much cheaper than carrying electricity over long distances from the power station but the question that i ask you is what is the policy infrastructure to make this happen to me that is the key so yes the policy that we will buy it is important the next is the rate at which we will buy it and the policy says that the state electricity regulatory commissions will establish this which is good it's not a top down approach but the third part of it is there must be a requirement because you know if you are doing a new business the vested interests will always prefer that we continue with business as normal if you want to do this then there must be a requirement that the electricity companies must buy this electricity before they buy any other i will also suggest that there is one more 
part which can help make this happen. And that is creating local water markets. So I do a solar pump and I actually on my uh, farm in rural Barabanki district in UP do have a solar pump. Can I sell the water to my neighbor? So my neighbor does not have to drill a, 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 a pipe and put a pump there, either solar or any other. So we tried, I tried to do this. Was it possible? Yes, it was. It was very difficult to find a price at which he and I will agree, but we finally found one. And then we started off a whole discussion on, uh, you know, the water that will come will evaporate by the time I get it, I will get less. There'll be water which will be absorbed by the by this soil and so on. Which then brought us to the issue of we need to have underground pipes. Aha! That's micro-irrigation now. You've got the infrastructure. Consequently, policies which provide for loans for underground piping, for metered, for meters that can be put with this, would be other kinds of things that can help create this market. In other words, helping create the policy that helps people to establish these kinds of businesses, to get into partnership with each other. And I, I greatly admire uh, Seva and Rima Ben for the way in which they have built up partnerships. That is, I think, at the heart of how we go ahead together. And this is also true if we want to make, for example, the rural LPG cooking a success. I believe the reason it hasn't been a success is because it's been a supply driven approach. It has not been something in which consumers have figured out what is the best way of uh, getting it and therefore policy supports the ways in which you can create partnership for that to make happen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, again, very, very important insights. and. You know, I mean, honestly, uh, ever since I've been working in the energy access space, the number of reports and conferences that I have personally seen or read on the grid integration, the microgrid, mini grid, and main grid integration, I think they're they're just I don't know how many hundreds and thousands of these reports, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people approach it from a technical perspective you know they see whether it is technically feasible it is technically possible whereas uh, again in my view it is way beyond that as you rightly said it is it is the need it is something which is really really needed and i think at this point it would be very very interesting to hear from ashwin on you know what their experience has been from the rockefeller smart power india initiative because you know they've been dealing with policy makers and stakeholders and all these issues of integration and technology so Ashwin, what have been your learnings uh, so far from this initiative about how do you really scale up these off-grid uh, solutions which actually get reliable, affordable uh, power to the last mile uh, customer and the communities, and especially given the recent initiative that you have with uh, Tata Power on the Tata Power Renewable Mini Grid. If you could just tell us a little bit about that and also maybe bring in some of the pain points that you have had, because I know it has not been an easy journey. So. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Rima Ben. Thank you, Ajay. And thanks, everyone. And, and happy Independence Day um, to everyone. Uh, it's great to join you all. I'm actually in New York, so it's past midnight here. So yes. it's Independence Day here, too. Um, so, you know, this is such a timely conversation because when we think about independence, we think about economic independence and we think about uh, inclusive economic uh, independence and what it means at the family level, uh, the, the question of energy is such a such a central one. And it's this sort of invisible hand that drives and empowers people and economies and lives and livelihoods. And yet, we don't often talk enough about it. And we don't often situate it at the heart of sort of conversations about economic development and empowerment. And I think in India, you know, we've made enormous progress with grid extension, as, as you yourselves uh, pointed out at the, at the, at the start. But what we've learned also um, over the last 10, 15, 20 years is that even as the grid is extended, even as hundreds of millions of people have been connected with basic access, that if you really want to lift people's economic opportunities to the next level, um, it's, it's not enough just to have the connection. You need to have the capability to consume power. You need to have an entire ecosystem of other um, investments that are coming in alongside that. And of course, you need the power to be 
reliable and you need the power to be affordable. Um, and this is where we still, I think, have an enormous amount of work to do and an enormous opportunity for innovation and integration, right? I think the biggest problem we faced is this sort of teeing up these kind of false choices, you know, grid versus off grid, um, you know, small scale versus large scale. This is, I, I just think it's a, it's, it's actually a counterproductive kind of conversation to have. Um, you know, it's not an either or, it's not about, you know, one system being better than the other. The reality is that actually we have an unprecedented opportunity to blend different scales of technologies and actually create the smart grid of the future that delivers power to people when they need it, for the purpose they need it. Um, so I think that's that's really been the ethos behind our work on trying to support the off-grid and mini-grid sector, not to say the grid has failed, so let's do something else. Most of the mini-grids that we're supporting, um, and there are about 350 of them in India now serving, you know, benefiting about 350,000 people, um, which is still at the end of the day a very small number in the Indian context. Um, most of them are operating alongside the grid. And at one level, you're looking at that and going, this is kind of, you know, this seems like a, 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 an inefficient way of, of running the system. But you can also see the reasons why. When you look at a small and mid-sized ent entrepreneur, if you're looking at a, within the agricultural sector and trying to, you know, grow your productivity, um, incre improve the storage, do processing, irrigation, all of those things, you know, you need the power to be available when you need it um, and, and, and at a quality that's going to make sure that you can actually achieve your economic goals. So you mentioned the Tata Power project. I mean, the Tata company, Tata Power themselves recognize this as a large scale utility, you know, that provides uh, connections to millions of people in Delhi and in Mumbai and, and now in Odisha. Um, you know, they also see that the rural last mile customer needs a adapted and different model. So many distribution companies in rural India are struggling still to provide that reliable, affordable, continuous service because, you know, the grid based technology in in, in isolation from others is probably not always the best way to serve consumers. And we need to think about how do we integrate distributed renewable energy technologies into these systems? And, and how do we integrate ultimately grid and off grid and these technologies at different scales? We look at the gains that we've seen with uh, the costs of technology, lithium ion batteries, photovoltaics, smart meters, invert the micro inverters, et cetera. We have just begun to scratch the surface of what can be possible um, in, in bringing together a new kind of grid vision for the grid in India and elsewhere in the world. And that's really what our work is trying to drive towards. I guess the last point I just make, um, and I can talk about the challenges, but I don't want to take too much of your time, is, you know, both uh, my previous speakers on, on have talked about agriculture and economic development. Um, I think more than just the new mindset around an integrated grid is we need to actually, we need to come back, back to this idea of integrated development. Um, and, you know, we used to talk about integrated rural development back in the 1970s in India. Um, and then we fell into our silos and we have enormous technological data and other, and other capabilities today to actually go to an IR, what I would call integrated rural development 2.0. Um, and I think energy, um, health, agriculture, and other economic activities uh, thought of as a combined, as a sort of an integrated um, approach is something that we really need to try and, and, and encourage a lot more of if we want to see the full potential of these new technologies realized on the ground for rural um, Indians, men, women, um, and all over the country. And, you know, in the context of COVID, um, when we've seen frankly, some setbacks in terms of economic activity, energy consumption. This is a perfect time to be thinking about it. Uh, the government has recently announced the Ag Infrastructure Fund, I think one lakh crore investments planned. But this is going to be entirely dependent on there being reliable energy available for these investments to flow. So let's start planning those things together. Right. No, I mean, very, very important because the number of reforms that the government has announced, especially in the agri sector in the last three months, if looked at in isolation i really don't know where they will go but if we actually look at it yeah. holistically as you said i think there is there is this potential for us to really change the way rural india operates and works so thank you so much uh, i want to continue talking to you ashwin because you spoke about technology so you know i mean because i i also look at africa i look at east asia and i'm seeing you know in the energy access space or you know as we say off-grid energy access space 
there is so much on technology especially on financing and payments which has happened in africa and sometimes i wonder india is a little uh, behind or south asia is a little behind uh, so you know digital payments uh, battery technology storage you mentioned some of them where do you see all of these uh you know headed where do you or which one do you think uh is going to be the one which will probably win the race or india will be at the forefront of any of these or will be you know will it be status uh co i mean what are what are your views because you're so closely connected to what's happening on the ground especially on technology yeah i mean look it's that's the billion dollar question i don't know that there's a winner or there's one thing that's going to be the silver bullet um you know i'll say a couple of things one is even in africa yeah yes yeah. so i think mobile money is something that we've seen far more progress in parts of africa and east africa in particular the mpesa experience and everything that came with that that i think we just need a, you know and i think we will get there in india with a with a much with a sort of revolution on that front and there's quite a lot of work happening around that in india at the government level and elsewhere um but you know even in africa um i was having a conversation with some technology technologists the other day you know we've seen lithium ion batteries for example come down 90% over the last decade yet a land the landed cost uh per unit of of lithium ion in in africa is still 3 to 4x what you get in in a, what you would uh, realize in in an oecd economy so there are so many other constraints to technology actually being translated on the ground um so you know i'm i'm not coming at this from a pure you know upstream technology innovation point of view alone but it's the application piece it's the regulatory frameworks it's bulk simple i mean not simple but you know frankly uh, aggregate procurement volume guarantees you know we are need we need to have bold ambitious joint ventures that can really translate these technologies and this is where i think india can play a huge role we have you know we we house the international solar alliance which is a global partnership that's thinking about these kinds of you know how do we get advanced market commitments and i think if we really get behind the distributed renewable sector in india um, not just declare victory on rural electrification and say you know we've we've electrified everyone so there's no rule for no rule for distributed but actually that that is the next generation of a functioning smart grid india can then be the driver of volume procurements uh, that can then benefit the rest of the world and and you know when you have companies like tata power coming in and and, and saying we want to build 10000 mini grids in india that's that's a that's a solution not just for india but for the world because that will open up the market in ways that we haven't seen as yet so i have a lot of optimism about the role that india can play even though the energy access conversation tends to be focused more on africa um for for other good and obvious reasons so i think we need a global approach to this and i think india will very much be at the heart of that right and also i think the microfinance uh, institution in india play a very very important role when it comes to kind of replicating the digital uh, payments that that's very very insightful Absolutely. uh thank you thank you so much i want to quickly uh, move back uh, to you dr mathur is because you know we've spoken a lot about connection energy access technology but another key component of the whole sdg 7 uh, topic is energy efficiency and i know you work so much in this space i have been looking at this space for some years uh, now and uh, i mean i really don't see the progress that should have happened really happening on the ground be it at a household level be it at an uh, enterprise level and for me uh, this has become even more critical with the sabhagya scheme coming in and giving electricity connection and if we as a country what we really want to happen is that all these 26 million households move up the energy ladder it means that over the next 3 to 5 years we want them to buy products we want them to buy household appliances we want them to buy productive appliances but you know it, it, then the need of the r is also to really build the market for energy efficient appliances to get to the rural market so what 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 is your view on this whole space of energy efficiency when it comes to energy access and you know equitable access to energy because i don't think it can be equitable if they don't have access to the right appliances and i'm talking about both you know at a household level as well as an income generating asset level uh, anjali uh, let's look at uh, a couple of programs which have been successful if you uh, look uh, at the availability of uh, led bulbs in 
rural Andhra Pradesh or rural Puducherry, for example, the way they occurred was when uh, chief ministers were able to converse their political ambitions with the energy efficiency ambition. And the way they did it was that they looked at an almost free, you know, I think it costed 10 rupees is what the user had to pay, an almost free LED bulb, which the regulatory commissions looked at, you know, this has occurred at a time when people were still buying electricity, which costed more, uh, and the savings would be less. So if both these states were buying electricity, they would save more. And consequently, if people used LED bulbs, there was a net savings. In other words, there was a very strong policy guidance through which the large scale rep, uh, adoption of LED bulbs are. I'm now looking at how can we make this happen uh, as we look at energy access. And uh, you will, I mean, I don't want to steal uh, EESL's thunder, Energy Efficiency Services Limited thunder, but they're looking at an innovative program in which the first thing that they do is in rural areas, set up small solar uh, uh, generating stations. So we are not talking of multi megawatts, but sometimes even less than a megawatt. So it is feeding one or two or three villages. But then the second thing they're saying is, we will also bundle in the kinds of devices that people use. Because again, one of the things that the LED example and ESL showed was that bulk procurement brings down prices. So whether it is fans, whether it is televisions, the bulk procurement of very efficient devices can make this available to these consumers if they want it at prices that are more competitive than you buy the less efficient things in the market. The short point I want to leave you with is that we need these market makers. ESL is one. Now in Andhra Pradesh, there, the government has created its own ESL. Uh, so the government of Andhra Pradesh has put in money, ESL has put in money and created this uh, joint venture. We would like to see many more of these and not necessarily in the state sector. Though being in the state sector, one of the things that they do is they have the cloud to get the electricity distribution companies to pay them. Having said that, and understanding the kinds of risks that these people take, my own uh, belief is that energy efficiency is really a question of aggregation. Because, uh, uh, you know, if you want to set up a megawatt or 100 megawatts of generating power, one large capitalist can make that decision. But if you want to save that much, there will be millions of people who will have to make a decision. So you need coordinating agencies. This is where I think we need to focus. Yeah. And which is where, you know, also, again, I, I go back to Seva, where, you know, we have millions of members and we are the organization that could also help, you know, in this whole initiative of uh, taking it to that next level. And with that, uh, Reema Ben, again, I want to come back to you because, you know, we've spoken about Seva's experience with, uh, you know, I know it started with lighting and then clean cooking. We spoke about solar, um, the Green Haryali initiative, the village level. But... Uh, what what have been the major issues that you know seva has faced in getting energy access to its member what what have been those issues really on the ground because it's one to talk about policy and an integrated approach and technology at a macro level but you know what really happened on the ground and how can some of those barriers be addressed uh, you know and how can we really communicate to those sitting at the policy making uh, tables to help organizations like seva continue to do the great work that you are doing. Uh, Reema Ben, you're muted. Um, sure, I think what I want to um, put on record here is to your question about the challenges. Is that uh, first and the foremost that you know in India, we don't um, see that how you know the um, small tiny nano entrepreneurs we don't consider them as a human capital but they are always seen as a liability 
actually they are the ones who take on willing to take on new challenges um and they are always eager without even expecting anything from the businesses or the government or the society so uh, when dr mathur was talking about aggregation i think we need to recognize these tiny tiny entrepreneurs and how can they have access to you know good but affordable technology which they can serve to the local communities and second is access to finance if a tiny entrepreneur needs a loan or <laughs> forget talking about equity investment but even if they want a loan where is the um, you know capital available so i think access to you know real good affordable technology and affordable finance i think those are the two major challenges that one sees and then comes at institutions that recognize them to give them the needed skills and capabilities and competencies so look at seva's example of clean cooking we were able to scale it up because we started supporting those women entrepreneurs who you know started with five connections or selling clean cook stoves or getting lpg connections today each one of them is handling anywhere between 5000 to 9000 connections in the household servicing them you know after sales maintenance re collection of loan repayments likewise look at the salt pan workers we started with just five salt pan workers it was actually ifc which provided us with what kind of financial architecture is needed so that the public sector banks have the comfort or the private sector banks have the comfort and today we have you know close to 3000 salt pan workers now using solar pumps and i'm very grateful for the partnership with the, the smart power india that our first micro solar park is up and running now from the 15th of august today so it's a real big day for us as well we are generating uh, with the solar park hopefully will generate 2.7 megawatt of energy as dr mathur was saying that we need to generate you know small small uh, micro grids and when this becomes a, a model a demonstrative model there would be several such tiny solar parks which will have to be come forward but unless and until there's an organization like seva which does the backward and the forward linkages it is beyond the reach of you know the local communities we had to struggle for 2 years to just get one tiny solar park commission i mean which entrepreneur or which uh, enterprise will have that kind of you know a bandwidth to struggle and work you know back and forth so i think um the kind of supply chain that is needed which is localized which is decentralized i think those are the kinds of policies which are needed which will then help us scale up and i think the covid as dr mathur was saying has really shown us that we need to invest more in decentralized green and clean energy infrastructures um you know we have vegetable growers and vegetable vendors and organically it has turned into an enterprise because those vendors started using electric rickshaws and the vegetable growers saw that the markets were all closed and they needed to store their vegetables so they demanded for setting up a solar powered cold storage which is very tiny and they can afford so i think the agriculture infrastructure fund which is which um, ashwin ji was referring to needs to be put into these kind of initiatives yes thank you rima ji and congratulations uh, i look forward to visiting the solar park as soon as the situation settles this Please, is i would really invite all of you to ashwin ji first and the foremost as soon as the travel ban is absolutely in fact you know, i'm i'm also looking at some of the q and a and chat boxes and there are so many congratulatory messages for you so congratulations from all of us uh, on this uh, and i i 
I, I think I'm going to move to my last question. I'm also conscious of uh, time. One last question to Ashwin before I uh, go back to all of you with one uh, uh, same question to all of you. But before that, to Ashwin. Um, Again, Ashwin, you uh, through the Rockefeller Foundation Smart Power Initiative are again very, very closely connected to communities, and you've really seen the impact of uh, COVID. So, can you tell us a little bit more about it, especially with relation to energy, the demand for energy, or the lack of demand for energy? You know what is really happening uh, on the ground? Yeah. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, it's a, it's obviously a really, really critical issue, and we are still learning, we're still observing, and I think this is an area that needs to be closely watched. So, obviously, once COVID hit and we started to see the economic uh, impact with the lockdowns, not just in India but in other markets as well in other countries, um, you know, we were very concerned about what this will do to the disruption to economic activity, and and for us. You know, we were in a position to be able to assess that through understanding what people are doing with energy consumption, right? Um, you know, the India has actually seen a fairly significant drop, uh, saw a fairly significant drop in 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 consumption outside the home, and we were tracking this through the mini grids that we work with and the data from that. So we actually partnered with a group um, to do remote surveys and phone-based surveys, covering about fifteen hundred or two thousand households, and so. In the very near term, there was about a 70% uh, drop in energy consumption within the first few weeks. Because, But what that reflected really was that the bulk of the consumption was happening outside the household. It was happening in small and mid-sized enterprises. And this is the whole point about you know, energy uh, and the economic linkages. Um, that has, uh, over the last few months, on average, it's been at around 40 to 50% reduction. That's obviously gone up again. I mean, the gap has started to narrow where, where economic activity has picked up and where once closures and lockdowns came to an end. Of course, we've gone back into lockdown in Bihar. Um, so, you know, we're waiting for the data on that to come through. Um, but, you know, it's it's what lies below that that's been quite worrying. Uh, when we were serving households, we were also trying to understand well, what is that actually doing to your to your sense of well-being and security, right, financial security. So 50% of households reporting that they, in general, define their financial situation as being much worse. So 67% saying that they're using savings in order to meet basic expenses that they had not been expecting to. Um, so one of the things that Smart Power India um, and Jaydeep and his team and us decided was let's implement an e-voucher scheme immediately uh, to actually provide billing relief to all, to, and in this case, it was about eight or 9,000 customers or maybe about 7,000 customers. Uh, where there was a 75% relief on billing in month one, 50% in month two, 25% in month three. Um, and it's administered through an SMS system. Um, a, to provide relief because people need cash in hands for other things and they don't need to be worrying about paying the electricity bill, but also really importantly to give us a signal of what kind of consumption levels are rebounding, particularly in the enterprise and SME side. And so we're you know using that data right now to really trying to understand how demand is changing and how we can support households and communities um, who are looking to recover economically. There's some optimism that with the return of my, you know, with so many migrants returning, perhaps there'll be this um, a kind of an SME rush, if you like, with new skills, new capital coming into rural India. Um, we don't know yet. I mean, we have to really support that. We have to watch that. Yes, it's a good opportunity, but you know, I expect some percentage of those people will return to cities once once things stabilize. So, it's a you know, it's a moment of of change and disruption, and we're doing our best with that data to really understand what's happening and and respond appropriately. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of been our, our experience so far. The the last thing I'd say is in the midst of all of this, you know, we have a fairly nascent off-grid and mini-grid sector still. We've been working at this sector for almost a decade now, but it's still a young sector. And for it to see its customer base struggling means the businesses themselves also are going to struggle. Um, and so we're also putting quite a lot of effort into helping those businesses stabilize and providing them with some level of cushion so that they can weather the, the storm. Great. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll now very quickly move to one question that we uh, that I have for all of you, and then we'll take up a few questions 
that we are seeing from the audience come in and maybe we start with dr mathur this time then go to reema ben and come back to ashwin uh, and the question from my end is that what is that one thing that you would really like to happen uh, you know that is sort of a dream that you have or sort of a wish thing wish list that could really accelerate uh, you know sdg 7 target achievement not just in india maybe globally but what is that that one thing that you really feel very strongly for so dr mathur then reema ben and nashwin uh, dr mathur you are muted reducing my wish list to one is always difficult but if it had to be one then i will look for things which can accelerate and enhance the uh, use of <clears throat> green technologies whether it be for uh, whether it be renewables or energy efficiency and the one thing which is very important is market creation and consequently as far as i am concerned this means that we need uh, supply chains which are either substitutes or parallel to the distribution channels what this needs is guarantees and these will have to be sovereign guarantees on repayments by other suppliers by non distribution company suppliers to a range of services that will bring in the kind of demand that we need for renewables and energy efficiency to be met Uh, you know one of the things that i went noticed recently was that if you go to the market um, and this is a market in a small mufassal town in uh, up if you go to the market it is absolutely impossible to find a five star refrigerator they are completely sold out and they are sold out because their operating costs are low and what people are saying is that operating costs matter a lot more now this is something i had not expected to see in my own professional life and i must say i'm immensely glad and consequently if we can enable the supply chain for this and now that there is a demand i think we can go ahead and look at sdg 7 being actually met okay thank you reema ben what is your wish list um i think <laughs> to when i talk about million plus in formal sector women workers just one thing is that when we talk about global programs i think uh, what uh, we as the informal sector women workers want is mainstream energy in livelihoods in the so be it in the form of you know what are the energy needs uh, of uh, agriculture or so what do the farmers want the forest workers want the plantation workers or the orchard workers want the artisans need for energy and a lot of investment will go into large infrastructure for energy and that is needed but i think what should happen especially is also basic primary energy infrastructure investment in that which is decentralized local bottom up i think that is one major uh, wish and also that you know the programs um should be designed differently that it is for and by the women the energy experts the discoms you know the energy enterprises the scientists but it needs to mainstream energy in all other walks of life as well thank you thank you thank you reema ben uh, ashwin what to yeah it's always a bit like ajay i'm struggling to think of one wish um you know but at at, at the kind of highest level I, i i guess it really would be a massive breakthrough in a kind of the shift in our mindset um to you know i talked about false choices earlier and i really genuinely believe that we are at a moment now where these are not either ors but these are ands these are everything and um and i think if we can really get that integrated thinking around the energy system and it it it's as important in in an advanced economy of europe or north america as it is in sub saharan africa and india and myanmar and elsewhere if we can get that integrated mindset where we think about you know unleashing 
the full power of distributed renewable technologies across every scale in urban areas for CNI, in rural areas for last mile access, for supporting you know grid balancing and and you know all of the different ways in which and then I would link it to Ajay's point about procurement. You know we've had some enormous visionary breakthroughs in other sectors over the last 20, 30 years through that kind of pool procurement thinking. If you think about Gavi and the, you know, the vaccine alliance, which is so, so timely a conversation today as we think of COVID, we need some equivalent of that for distributed renewable technologies globally uh, and an institution that can lead and drive that. Um, so that's what I would wish for. Yeah, that's a great wish list that I have from all of you. And the reason I forced you to give me only one is a storytelling uh, workshop that I attended some time back, where you have to really come down to that one thing that you uh, want, which is difficult, but I think it's really, really useful. We have actually uh, addressed a large number of questions that were coming from you know, the audience on multiple chat platforms that we have. Uh, there's one that I'm going to take up now because we only have about three or four minutes uh, left and I don't want us to be cut down. And Ima Ben, the congratulatory messages keep coming uh, for you. Um, so one question and maybe uh, Dr. Mathur can take this up is the whole issue of stability of the grid vis-a-vis uh, -vis intermittent renewable energy uh, power goals of more than 150 gigawatts. So there are a number of people who have asked for your or, or the panelists' views on you know how does this work and because you and Ashwin are more closely associated with this topic of integration. Uh, it would be great to hear from first maybe Dr. Mathur, you, and then if we have time from Ashwin also. The very, very quick answer is stability of the grid is not an issue. It's not an issue till at least we reach about 40% renewable energy, intermittent renewable energy in the grid, and possibly even more than that. <clears throat> and the reasons are very simple to look at. <clears throat> the first is <clears throat> that we have an adequate amount of backup energy, <clears throat> whether it is coal, whether it is nuclear, uh, that can provide the base. The second is that, at least as far as solar energy is concerned, it's fairly uh, predictable. So you know when you need to have the ramp ups or ramp downs. Consequently, as long as we build a system in which there is a requirement for a quick ramp up and ramp down of coal power stations, that's number one. Number two, we build a system in which we provide incentives for people to reduce their loads when they're asked to. So if there's a sudden increase, the electricity company could tell people, please reduce your load by 10%. And if you do so, we will reduce your tariff by three paisa per unit or something of that sort. And given today's air conditioning load, it's actually possible. Because all you need to do is to increase the set point temperature of an air conditioner by two degrees centigrade, and you get a one and a half percent saving on electricity. In other words, it's possible. So that's the second. And the third is obviously we are moving towards a future in which we can have storage, particularly battery storage, but other kinds of storage as well, pumped hydro and so on, which can be used to make up the stability at the time when uh, renewable electricity is either just coming in or going out. Over a period of time, the prices will drop of, of storage. Over a period of time, the amount of coal electricity that we have, which can balance this, will reduce. So these two things will work in opposite directions, but for, in the same time period. In the early time period, Coal will take on the brunt of burden of stability. In the longer time period, storage will take on the brunt of stability. But it is possible. Uh, Ashwin, any thoughts? And also, I want to mention that we're getting a lot of interest on the chat on the integrated approach that you mentioned. So if there's anything else that you want to tell us about that, any other thoughts this would be a great uh, option. Yeah, I mean, I think Ajay dealt very, very comprehensively with the question on grid stability. On the integration piece, it's really a, a very simple 
uh, point and it's something that many um, you know electricity planners and regulators and, and investors are looking at which is you know we have to get to a truly integrated model with any given economy of what is the combination of technologies uh, that you need to actually get behind and how do you do it as one electrification system so how do you combine grid mini grid off grid um, as you think about last mile distribution and coverage um, this is particularly in sub-saharan africa where the grid has still got a long way to go in terms of being built out so you know there's a whole bunch of different least cost electrification models out there um, the question is, how do we get these adopted and really built on, on strong evidence bases so that we can truly leverage the range of technologies that are out there? And I think right now we're not doing enough um, to really take advantage of, of, the, of the opportunities that are in front of us. Yes, th thank you, Ashwin. Uh, and one, one last question that I have, and then we will close this uh, session, is for Rima Ben. Uh, Rima Ben, this is not a question, but there are comments that we are getting from the audience on, you know, the the wonderful points that you have uh, raised on skill building and capacity building, and how the access to learning content and you know use of technology is so vital to creating all the women uh, entrepreneurs that you create. Is there anything that you want to share on that uh, topic? Any learnings or you know, any experience? Um, thank you. I just wanted to say that um, if, if we really want to succeed in you know, skilling and building the capacities of women entrepreneurs, this is an era of partnerships. And I think we've been able to do this um, purely because of partnerships with organizations like Smart Power India or with the UNEP or with IFC. And I think that is what, and I wanted to tell Ashwin that you were talking about Gavi and you know there needs to be a global alliance. Smart Power India can at least take the lead in building an alliance in India for DREs. And I think this is the time, so I would really uh, call you on upon for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rima Ben and Ashwin. There's a task for you <laughs> now to take forward. So, uh, but thank you. Thank you so much uh, to everyone, to, you know, Dr. Mathu, Rima Ben, Ashwin uh, for joining us. Uh, it is typically a holiday that most Indians believe 15th August to be in, but it's so good to have the day started with a conversation with you. Uh, I still remember my day with Terry, Dr. Ajay Mathu. I, never miss a single Independence Day celebration. And I hope at some point the alumni is going to get invited <laughs> to that. I, I really look forward to that. Uh, but thank you so much. And thanks to everyone thank for you. joining. And again, a big thank to all the organizers uh, for organizing this wonderful event. I, I had a really, really nice time talking to all of you.